Uh, I'm going to talk about these two uh, fellows, uh, Julius and uh, Philip uh, Epstein. I don't know which is which. Uh, mostly I can. This looks like they was taken. They still have a little bit of hair, so it was probably taken uh, either in college, Penn State, which they loved, or shortly afterward. No one could tell them apart, and in Hollywood they were simply known uh, everywhere in Warners and through the industry as the boys. And um, Jack Warner, who I'm also going to talk about, uh, couldn't tell them apart either. And there was one day when there's a big crisis in Jack's life, he uh, turned around the corner on the lot, and a very rare sight, one of them, because they always were together, one of them was walking toward him, and Jack breaks into a sweat because he, he doesn't know which one it is. Is it Phil? Is it Julia? I don't know. And he's getting closer and closer, and the sweat's coming down, and finally he's right on top of this fellow, and he just goes, hello, boys, and walks, <laughs> walks by. Uh, Julie and, F and Phil um, were legendary wits and screenwriters. They wrote together more than 50 films in uh, one of the, perhaps the golden age of Hollywood. You know, some of them, Arsenic and Old Lace, and Man Who Came to Dinner, and Yankee Doodle Dandy, and Casablanca, and many others. Um, they were born um, in Brooklyn, but raised in the Lower East Side, where they had to do the usual thing on the Lower East Side, which is to fight their way out of the neighborhood. The Irish block, they had to fight their way through. The Italian block, they had to fight their way through. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that when they landed in Penn State, they were both on the boxing team. Julie was the captain of the boxing team, and not only that, was a bantamweight, a NCAA bantamweight champ of Pennsylvania. And after college, he had one uh, a professional fight, um, which ended in a draw, and I said to him once, Julie, why didn't, you, why didn't you go on with your career? And he said, I wanted to retire undefeated. <laughs> they uh, came to Hollywood in the um, early 30s, Julie first. Uh, Julie um, was invited to Hollywood by a friend at Penn State. Uh, his whole education in films was, they went to the movies one afternoon, and this guy said, uh, that's a long shot, that's a medium shot, that's a close-up, and that was Julie's entire education in films. He went and lived in the valley where he wrote a treatment every single night, a new treatment. And he hooked up with Jerry Wald. Uh, and Jerry Wald is uh, Sammy in What Makes Sammy Run, the great Bud Schulberg novel that I'm sure many of you have read. Julie is Julian in that film. And what would happen is that Jerry Wald would be at a writer's conference and stuck for something, and they would break for lunch, and he'd dash out to the valley. Julia would give him the dialogue. He'd dash back, and they'd say, Jerry, you're a genius. And that went on, that went on for a long time until Julie demanded credit for a film. So his first film credit, you can see it on Turner Classic Movies, which practically an Epstein Brothers Film Festival, Turner Classic Movies, uh, Living on Velvet. Much the same thing was going on at RKO with my father, Phil, uh, and he, he, there was a co-credit for Living on Velvet and a co-credit for Gift of Gab, which was Phil's first film. Then they came together at um, Warner Brothers, and uh, Jack Warner signed them on. Now, these were not a Jack Warner type. They were fun-loving, wise-cracking, late-sleeping, uh, a couple of guys, and uh, worse, Jews to boot. And um, there's a famous story about Jack who went up to Jacob Julie Garfinkel, otherwise known as John Garfield, and said, uh, Jake, uh, they're going to find out you're a Jew sooner or later, better later. And so <laughs> changed his name to Garfield. And they did the same thing with Julie and Phil. Uh, and they declined. But it led to one of their first gags on Jack, and that was um, they had a fraternity uh, brother or friend at Penn State named Don Taylor, who became a fine actor and director, directed Tom Sawyer and other films. They brought him out as a very young kid to uh, Warner Brothers, and then they st stole into Jack's office, got a piece of stationery, and they sent Don a letter 
on official Warner Brothers stationery signed by Warner. And it said, Dear Mr. Taylor, the entire Warner Brothers family invites you uh, to our studio, welcomes you to our studio, and looks forward to wonderful, fruitful years working together under your new name, Hyman Rabinowitz. <laughs> they also brought another pal from Penn State out there, and they put him on the payroll for six months, and no one knew who the hell he was and what he was doing, but he was listed as uh, an actor named Sherwood Forrest, and uh, no, one, no one ever figured it out. <laughs> now, this business about Jews to boot uh, is important, I think, because Hollywood was never comfortable with the fact that it really became essentially a Jewish industry, and they behaved poorly during World War II, with re really rather an exception of Jack Warner himself. But... Uh, the only film that Julian uh, and Phil produced uh, was a film called Mr. Skeffington, which you can see all the time with Betty Davis and Claude Rains on the, on the Epstein Brothers Film Festival, Turner Classic Movies. And in that film, uh, Claude Rains is divorcing Betty Davis. They have a daughter. And Rains takes his daughter out for lunch at a fancy restaurant, like Rainbow Room, perhaps. And he says to her, dear, your mother and I are leaving each other, and I want you to go live with your mother. And this was 1942-43, right, in the middle of the war. And the daughter says, Daddy, Daddy, why? I want to stay with you. Why do I have to go with Mommy? And Rain says to her, well, you see, darling, uh, I'm Jewish, and your mother's not, and it'll be much better for you to live with your mother. And that's the only time that I'm aware of in all of World War II from beginning to end, that in any domestic film used the word Jew or Jewish. The industry was terrified of, of creating a situation where people would have to fight for Jews and where the industry would be identified uh, with that fight. So I'm very proud of the fact that Julie and Phil have that in, um, in Mr. Skeffington. I also said uh, that they were late sleepers. And uh, indeed, they were. I remember uh, our house on San Remo Drive. Julie would come over around noon. Uh, they'd have a bite to eat. They'd work for an hour and a half or two hours. And then they'd go play tennis all afternoon. And maybe at the end of the day, they'd go up, drive out to Burbank, if, if at all. And it drove Jack Warner crazy. And uh, he called him into the office. He said, this is ridiculous. It's intolerable, and I won't stand for it. His bank presidents have to show up at 9. Railroad presidents show up at 9. Executives of every corporation in America show up at 9. And you're going to have to show up at 9. At which point Julie said, fine, Jack. Then have a bank president finish the script. <laughs> <laughs> a little later on, uh, they were having trouble with the script. And they didn't know what, what the hell. They threw everything together without randomly. And they sent it off to Jack's office. And Jack calls him in. And he says, this is the worst crap I've seen in my entire life. How dare you hand something into me like this? I'm not going to pay you for it. I'm not going to use it and never pull something like this again. At which point, my father looks up and rather sweetly says, how could this happen, Jack? We wrote it at 9. <laughs> oh, and Jack said, uh, and I want the money back that I've already paid you on that script. And my father said, I'm awfully sorry, Jack, but we just uh, used it to put in a pool. However, if you're ever in the neighborhood and want to come by, <laughs> feel, free, feel free to do so. Now, the boys were um, uh, on the left. They were Roosevelt Democrats, which means far to the left of the current pusillanimous Democratic Party, which is basically a party of Rockefeller Republicans, as I see it now. Um, and they were progressive, but they, they were Roosevelt Democrats, and Julie, and especially Julie, but both of them were involved in the struggle to form the Screenwriters Guild. And there was once in association with that a strike at Warner Brothers, and it really turned ugly. And Jack called the thugs out, and there were people were sent to the hospital, and shots were fired, and it was really a, a, a rough strike. Uh, now, the official motto at Warner Brothers, and there's a big billboard that says it, is Warner Brothers combining good picture making with good citizenship. And Julie sent a memo around, a memo around to everybody in the studio saying, we've changed our motto 
from now on it's going to be known as Warner Brothers, combining good picture making with good marksmanship. <laughs> the politics led in 1947 to Jack naming names, and he named Julie and Phil, who were never members of the Communist Party. I remember a big debate. I can remember hearing them say it. Do we vote for Wallace? Do we vote for Truman? And they voted for Truman. They were, but they were on the left. And Jack basically named everybody who had a contract dispute with. And, he, and they asked him why the Epsteins. He says, they're always on the side of the underdog. It's un-American. Or in fact, the American thing is to be on the side of the underdogs. So the House Un-American Activities uh, Committee sent them a subpoena and a document that they had to fill out. And the document quite famously said, are you now or have you ever been a member of a subversive organization? And if so, part B, name that organization. And the boys filled it out. And they said, have you ever been a member of a subversive organization? They said, yes. Name that organization. They said, Warner Brothers. <laughs> Well, the feud, the feud went on a long time. It lasted and lasted, and um, my father died quite early. Jack Warner died, and then uh, Julie lived a long, full, rich, and productive life. And toward the end of it, I was doing some research on a book called Pandemonium in which Julie and Phil appear as characters, a sort of wisecracking and wise Greek chorus. And um, I said to Julie, I'm researching all this stuff, and I saw that when Jack made Midsummer Night's Dream, a movie with Mickey Rooney and Merle Oberon. You see it all the time. Uh, they had a big banquet to celebrate the film. And the banquet um, had a brochure, and uh, just a very expensive one, heavy paper. And on the left-hand side of the brochure, in gold bar relief, there was a profile of Shakespeare. And on the right-hand side, there was a bar relief in gold facing of Jack Warner. And I told that to Julie, and Julie said like this, uh, neither one ever heard of the other. <laughs> so the feelings lasted. Uh, one last story is um, uh, when Casablanca, uh, which basically they wrote every word of, except for, uh, uh, there are a lot of dispute about this, but I know of only two lines that they didn't write. Uh, 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 Frank, for your thoughts. And then Hal Wallace's great last line. Um, beginning of a beautiful friendship. When the film itself won the Academy Award, Hal Wallace, who des absolutely deserved it, decided everything, the lighting, the dresses, the actor, everything. Hal Wallace stood up to go on the stage, and there was like the sound of a stampede coming from his right, and coming down the aisle, stepping on everybody's toes, elbowing out of the way, was Jack Warner. And he jumps up on the stage and grabs the Oscar just before Hal Wallace could take it and goes off the stage. After which, Hal Wallace quit Warner Brothers and went to work for uh, Zanuck at Fox. Well, Jack wasn't quick enough uh, to grab this. And this is the Oscar, Phil Epstein, my father's Oscar, that he won for Casablanca. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah.